There are numerous aspects of technology that move in cycles. Its flow has momentum, precision, and repetition. Today I'll discuss some history, our present day, and aspects of what the next decade is likely to hold for us as users of technology. Now, how many of you are thinking to yourself, what the heck does tech have to do with jellyfish? <laughs> I appreciate your candor. To provide an initially brief answer, I have come to realize that jellyfish make an excellent living visual metaphor and model for aspects of computer technology. I promise that I will explain this further after having provided some initial background. When I was young and disinterested in memorizing dates for a history class, my mother told me it was important to learn history to keep it from repeating itself. The cyclic nature of technology, however, does show that history can repeat itself, but in a positive way. I will confess that the mention of the word history still conjures imagery of the required task of date memorization and nodding off during those history classes that were not taught by the most dynamic of teachers. Hopefully I haven't lulled anybody to sleep so far. In the early days of computing technology, we had massive mainframe computers that occupied facilities and had support staff running around the centralized area to tend to the processing, storage, and connectivity infrastructure. All the heavy-duty functionality happened in those facilities as the programs themselves were stored there, the processing power that ran them was there, and the storage that kept everything was there. The users were in other locations and connected to the mainframe on terminals like this one. These were sometimes referred to as dumb terminals, as they really only showed prompts and responses from the mainframe on their screens, and allowed for keyboard input to issue commands back to the mainframe. The smart side of things was back at the mainframe location. The terminals connected back to the mainframe through network connections, and the mainframe was the central point in the model. You could think of this as being something like a wagon wheel with spokes, and at one end of the spokes you would have the terminals. At the other end, you have a centralized hub, which is where the mainframe is. I mentioned earlier that the visual metaphor of the jellyfish can be applied to a number of areas of computer technology. This is the first of them. The jellyfish physically resembles this network model as its lappets extend outward in a similar manner to the network connections for the terminals. And the lappets connect back to the central hood, just as the network terminals connect to the mainframe. We refer to this type of model as being centralized computing. Its characteristics are processing and storage at a centralized location, remote terminals allowing for basic input-output functionality, which connect back to the central location. And I should also point out that there are inherent advantages in terms of maintenance, as the majority of what needs to be taken care of is in one facility. And if a remote user has problems, it is likely either a terminal has gone bad that is relatively inexpensive and easy to replace, or there is a network issue. As time moved on, we saw the advent of the personal computer. Tubes had been replaced by transistors, and things became significantly smaller. What filled a room a decade or two prior could now fit on one's desktop. Businesses moved away from centralized computing and adopted the model of using personal computers. There were advantages and disadvantages in this coming to be. The advantages came in the ability to have much more rich and powerful applications running at your fingertips, as opposed to a dumb terminal with only text. There was also the ability to customize configurations based on the individual's needs and to install off-the-shelf applications. In terms of disadvantages, a level of efficiency was abandoned in this transition as a great deal of redundancy needed to be introduced and the ability to share data was reduced. In moving to a decentralized model, these small but powerful machines no longer had access to central storage, and even things like printing required each computer to have its own printer. Support also became decentralized, and much more needed to be done to keep the systems on the desktops of the remote users running well. To address some of these deficiencies, local area networks and file servers came into play. These allowed the desktop machines to join a wagon wheel type network and share things like files and printers. The file server acted as the mainframe did to the extent that it was a centralized resource, but the workstations were also able to some extent connect to one another for sharing of things as well. 
This movement towards decentralization advanced our capabilities in moving us forward with technology, and yet showed an initial lacking of some of the inherent offerings that centralized computing offered. This led us back into somewhat of a centralized model to recover those abilities. Our second metaphorical use of the jellyfish occurs here. We recognize that there are patterns of ebb and flow towards and away from centralized computing. I had initially considered the ocean as a potentially viable visual way to depict this motion, but I realized that the tide simply receded and flowed back again, and that did not allow for showing of moving forward. The jellyfish presented a much better depiction of this due to the way that it moves. It gracefully advances itself, just as technology does. Moving forward, as it contracts and expands its central hood, it depicts the cycle computer technology goes through as it centralizes and decentralizes. The repetition of centralization and decentralization does not stop here. As our computers continue to become more sophisticated, we find ourselves embarking on a more significant centralization move than ever before. I will go into that more shortly, but first our third visual metaphoric use of our friend the jellyfish. As computer applications mature and become more sophisticated, they are generally more resource intensive to run. As a result, there is great demand for more powerful processors ones that can accomplish more in the same period of time. As a new generation of processor comes to market, one of the performance measures is how much it can accomplish within a clock cycle. The amount of movement a jellyfish can accomplish within an expansion and contraction cycle is similar to this. Due to the difference in size, more mature ones can move farther in the same cycle than younger ones. Similarly, with the growth of the number of transistors that are included as the generations of chips advance, they too can do more in one cycle. Consider what your current generation processor can do in comparison to the one you had a decade Speaking ago. Speaking of current processors, let's move ahead to present day and take a look at how we got here and what we have. Without question, the most significant movement related to computer technology in the last 20 years has been the commercialization and expansion of the Internet. It has gone from being a government resource to one made available for the scholarly work of universities to something that commercial service providers have made available to the public. This single aspect has forever changed the way we communicate, research, stay informed, recreate, and learn. Beyond that, it has greatly increased the demand for computer network bandwidth, storage space, and applications and devices allowing us to access it from anywhere, anytime. We have gone from dial-up modems at slow speeds to broadband connections at premium prices, both in our homes and on our portable devices. It's no longer an option or luxury. It's our fifth utility and a necessity. I'll let you count off the first four on your own time. I did it before the presentation. We have also seen a transformation of our industries in their moving from the physical to the intellectual. In 2011, a computer company overtook the biggest oil company and became the most valuable company in the world. This was not a unique case. Even in the aftermath of the dot-com bubble bursting and our economy recovering from recession, there are strong players in tech. If we have a look at some financial visualization charts showing companies and their market capitalization, we can see that the highest value sector in the S&P 500 is technology. Beyond that, a closer look reveals that the largest entities are companies providing network access like AT&T and Verizon, Cisco Systems, the largest maker of computer network hardware, computer hardware makers like IBM, HP, Dell, Intel, and Apple, those authoring applications and services like Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, Google, and Apple, and those providing operating systems like Microsoft, Google, and Apple. That Apple name sure does come up a lot, huh? <laughs> now that we have arrived at present day, let's take a look at the devices we use and how we're using them. It is not uncommon for the typical IT savvy person to have a barrage of devices. These may include desktop computer, which is the main trusted steed, notebook computer to take with them place to place and use while dismounted from the trusted steed, smartphone to allow them access to communications and various apps and data while not using the desktop or notebook, 
and more and more these days, a tablet device for when the smartphone is too small and the desktop and notebook may not be convenient. Of these devices, the smartphone and tablet are the newcomers. The smartphone was a natural consolidation of things like cell phones, pagers, and PDAs. A major trend in technology has been that when add-on or unique devices become common enough, we integrate them into others. This is a good thing, as it can help with higher reliability in using a single manufacturer, fewer things to carry, fewer batteries to take care of, and ultimately fewer obsolete items of which we need to dispose. Don't worry, no jellyfish analogy to apply here. The major differences among the device types is in their varying degrees of performance and portability and their different form factors. The desktop can run most anything and there's no concern for battery life. It does tether us to a desk, but it generally will contain more storage, have a lower price, and offer higher performance when compared to a notebook of the same generation. The notebook is a full-blown computer we can take with us. Battery life is a major factor, and as previously mentioned, they generally have less storage available and lower specifications for processors and for RAM. The higher price to performance ratio in most cases is due to smaller component sizes, needed power efficiency, and heat dissipation concerns. The smartphone was a natural evolution of things, and the sales of these devices and their service contracts have exploded in recent years. We want to be able to communicate with anyone, anywhere, at any time, and we want to be able to stay current on the things that are important to us. The apps being made available are pretty astonishing as well. On the subject of apps, a friend of mine commented that she really likes their efficiency and that the apps actually make it easier to access the things she wishes over traditional computers. I'll admit it took me a little thinking to appreciate that, but the fact is, the specialized applications do make getting to things easier than having to open a browser, go to a site, log in, and navigate a command structure that is designed for larger screens. They really can make it easier to do things as their interfaces are designed for these devices and the functions of a given service are made very easy to work with. Beyond that, these devices are pretty much always ready to go. No boot up time is necessary. Ah, the tablet computers. I have yet to own one. I can't get my head wrapped around them. I see more and more people buying them and they seem to really like them. To me, it's just a bigger smartphone screen, and yet one more thing to carry and replace that is not inexpensive. I believe the tablet to be more of a device that is attempting to bridge the gap between smartphone and notebook, but it lacks the processing power, full applications, and storage of a notebook. It also seems to be something more designed to read and view content than it is for data entry. It doesn't come with a traditional keyboard. I would really prefer not to create my dissertation document on something like this. I know you can buy an add-on keyboard to make it easier to enter data, but consider the advantage the texting, Twitter, and inconvenient data entry methods have given us. They limit us to brief, concise communications, unlike this presentation. So we've discussed the present in detail. Now it's time to look forward. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, the future or at least some aspects that seem very likely to become dominant in the next five to 10 years. We have come to a point in tech where we have rich computing experiences and are able to share with one another more than ever before regardless of distance. The number of devices we have to pay for and feed is getting somewhat out of hand. Tech becomes obsolete pretty quickly, doesn't it? Though the manufacturers do love to sell us replacements. Our jellyfish now brings us back towards centralized computing. If you think about it, the dumb terminals of yesterday were there to allow connections to servers to which users issued commands and the servers did the processing work and provided the results back on the screens. Simple input and output. Today, in some instances, our device becomes like a terminal. Sometimes it's called software as a service, other times cloud-based apps, and sometimes we just think of something as being a website. Consider these. Facebook, Gmail, eBay, Google. We open a browser. We see content on our screens, and we provide commands that are processed remotely and results displayed locally. These are some everyday examples, but things are expanding with offerings like Google Apps and Microsoft Office 365 that allow us to do word processing, spreadsheet presentations, and other common functionality collaboratively and totally online. For that matter, wouldn't Prezi qualify then too? 
No need to install anything on our devices. Just connect, do, and store there. The way of the future has our applications running on remote systems and our documents and other files stored in what is being called the cloud. It is simply an online accessible area to keep our stuff. Some examples include Dropbox, SkyDrive, and Google Drive. The other major changes to come are in the devices themselves. Everything becomes more about the viewable area, the input method, and our network connections. Support for these devices is also greatly simplified, as most of the application updates are done remotely. Like our dumb terminals, if the device becomes problematic, either give it a simple refresh or toss it and get another one. In the bigger picture of things, this also means that it will be more about the size of the device than what is under the hood. After all, dumb terminals do not need too much horsepower. So how big a screen is big enough? What do we need to be able to effectively input data on these devices? I envision more of a convertible model, where we have something like a smartphone in our pocket and it keeps our stuff handy. When we need a larger interface to interact with our stuff, it can wirelessly connect to things like Google or Oakley's proposed heads-up display glasses. Imagine how big a screen can appear that close to your face. Or perhaps it docks with a larger screen device that has a more traditional input method available. Perhaps you're thinking about voice recognition. Hello Siri, are you there? It has come a long way, but I believe it will remain from being ideally suited when we're in public places, due both to noise and privacy issues that you wouldn't want to dictate certain things aloud. Or perhaps even people thinking you're talking to them, or worse yet, talking to yourself. My biggest suggestion is to embrace the change that is coming. I would like to close by giving you something else that may someday prove to be helpful. If you are also a fan of sitcoms and love the ocean, please ignore Joey Tribbiani's suggestion to Monica of what to do when stung by a jellyfish. According to Scientific American, convincing your distressed friend that urinating on them helps will only add insult to injury. Trust the jellyfish, keep a respectful distance, and never let your friends pee on you. <laughs>